There is killing time, saving time, buying time, borrowing time, and of course, wasting time. Today, I promise not to waste your time as I talk about the history of horology and the good old timepiece. But before all else, remember to like, subscribe, and ring that bell. You don't wanna miss out on any of our future videos. The study of time, or at least the measurement of it, dates back to 1450 BC, when the ancient Egyptians first observed the Earth's natural circadian rhythms. This is your body's internal clock that helps you with essential functions and processes like when to wake up, when to sleep, and when to eat. Seems basic enough, right? A system of reactions that send signals throughout your body. The ancient Egyptians used large obelisks to track the sun's movement in order to keep time. Early Greeks used water clocks called klepsidras. A klepsidra, which in Greek means water thief, was a vessel filled with water that would escape slowly through a hole. The vessel's inside was marked with graduated lines, and the time was read by measuring the level of the remaining water. Time keeps rolling on, I guess. And after sundials, the next big step forward in horology came in the 17th century with the development of the pendulum. This helped clocks maintain their accuracy, but with the emergence of maritime navigation, the need to keep accurate track of time at sea was critical. Pendulums and swaying ships don't exactly get along. In 1933, Dr. Reinhard Straumann invented Niverox. It's a complex iron-nickel alloy that also features several trace elements, like cobalt and titanium. Trace elements like these can also color some of your favorite gemstones. Anyways, it was with the invention of Niverox that the hairspring was born. The hairspring was much more advanced than the pendulum, not only in shape, but also in material composition. It was more compact, more stable, and therefore much more reliable about telling time, especially at sea. Next, it was time for the wristwatch. Originally, and up until the 20th century, wristwatches were worn almost exclusively by women, and men wore pocket watches. With the onset of World War I, however, the military realized what an asset the wristwatch was for coordinating synchronized attacks. So, disregarding the fashion trends of the time, they had their soldiers strap watches on their wrists. Seeing all those cool ace pilots come home with watches on their arms shifted the public perception of the wrist watch and normalized wrist watches for men. Watchmaking soon became a widespread industry and the next evolution in horology would take place with the development of electronic clocks. These were based on the movement of a vibrating crystal, quartz, and its piezoelectric properties. When compressed or bent, quartz generates a charge or voltage on its surface. More importantly for watches and timekeeping, it works the opposite way too. When an electric charge is applied to a quartz crystal, it will vibrate with a remarkably consistent frequency. It's this vibrating phenomenon that made quartz so integral in watch advancement. You may remember the piezoelectric experiment video I did with Christopher. Click here to watch. It's worth noting that quartz watches, though significantly more accurate than a mechanical timepiece, are not the most accurate clocks out there. That title is reserved for atomic clocks. These mechanisms employ radioactive atoms, such as cesium-133, to keep track of time. Atomic clocks are super accurate. They only lose a couple of seconds over thousands of years. Researchers in the U.S. have actually developed the world's smallest commercial atomic clock, called the SA.45S Chip Size Atomic Clock, CSAC. If you'd like to take one home, it could be yours for 1500 bucks. The clock was initially developed for military use and is about the size of a matchbox. It weighs about 35 grams and has a power requirement of only 115 megawatts. Way smaller than a gigawatt, when you say, Doc? Wait, God. Since we're talking about time, I thought I'd share some interesting historical facts about watch manufacturing. And it starts with Madame Marie Curie. As you probably already know, Madame Curie discovered the chemical element radium. After many years of working with radium, Marie Curie was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in physics in 1903. Later in 1911, she won a Nobel Prize in chemistry and became the first person to claim Nobel honors twice. So I bet you're asking, what does this have to do with watchmaking? A century ago, glow-in-the-dark watches were an irresistible novelty. It was discovered that watch dials covered in a special luminous paint glowed all the time and didn't require charging in sunlight. You know, like uh, magic. I don't have time for your magic tricks. Illusions, Dad. You don't have time for my illusions. What is wrong with you? 
One of the first factories to produce these watches opened in New Jersey in 1916. The company hired around 70 women, the first of thousands to be employed in many such factories in the United States. They were well paid and it was a glamorous job. The women in several facilities opened around the US had been told the paint was harmless. Well, it wasn't. Women were ingesting deadly amounts of radium after being instructed to point their brushes on their lips because it was the easiest way to get a fine point on the brush. These women were painting numbers on dials as small as a single millimeter in width. Thinking the paint was harmless, some even painted their fingernails, face, and teeth with the glowing substance. After its discovery, radium even became thought of as an all-powerful tonic. Product manufacturers created all sorts of everyday products, from toothpaste to bar soaps. The radium girls, as they would come to be called, were ingesting radium on a daily basis. Radium behaves much like calcium, and since your body uses calcium to grow bones, once radium is ingested, the body confuses it with calcium, and it gets absorbed straight into the bone. I don't have to tell you how dangerous that is. Do I? Well, just in case. When the luminous watches got fashionable in the early 1920s, the world was becoming somewhat aware of the risk of radioactivity. But radiation poisoning isn't instant. So years went by before any of the women developed symptoms. Many of them actually thought they were getting healthier by consuming it. Radium does stimulate red blood cells, but over time, it simply becomes a flesh-eating poison. In the early 1920s, many of the women developed what would become to be known as radium jaw. It started with symptoms of fatigue and toothaches. After all, they were putting it in their mouths. The first death associated with radium watch dial manufacturing came in 1922. 22-year-old Molly Maggia suffered from radium jaw, which was described as the deterioration of the lower jawbone. It was so brittle that eventually it had to be completely removed. Eventually, the women sued and changed occupational hazard laws forever. Although compensated, it didn't keep them from being sick, and many agreed to be studied during their lives and even after their passing. The Food and Drug Administration banned the substance, and all deceptive packaging was eventually phased out. Back to Madame Curie. Throughout her work with radium, Curie was unaware of the effects of radioactive exposure on the body. In her lab, it was said that she would keep tubes of radium in her pocket. Later, she began to suspect that radium was harmful to the body when one of her fellow researchers died of a blood disease. And then a few years later, her personal assistant died of the same affliction. Even though she suspected that radium exposure was bad for her health, she didn't do very much to monitor her own. She began to notice her vision was deteriorating and radiation burns on her fingers were becoming more and more painful. Coincidentally, Madame Marie Curie herself died in 1934 of aplastic anemia, likely caused by her long-term exposure to radiation. Nowadays, our watches are a lot less deadly. In fact, many new watches can improve your health. With the advent of smartwatches, you can use them to monitor your heart rate, as a GPS, you can even order pizza, all from your wrist. Let's just hope we don't forget what they were made for in the first place. So that was fun, a timely episode indeed, get it? Tell me what is your favorite watch? Are you a purist when it comes to telling time on your wrist or are you more of a modern day smartwatch wearer? Would you wear a radioactive watch just to look cool or glow in the dark? Let me know in the comments and thanks for watching.